lights and you won't come up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Father, you're being so, so good to us. Overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Chases me down time after time. How many of you being chased down by the love of God? Just, it just keeps coming after you, just keeps coming after you. You can't run from it. Father, we receive the fullness of what you're doing in this hour in our life. Father, we stop running. You know, this week I flew into Toronto. I was at the Sick Kids Hospital where my nephew is, and he's an intensive care unit. And this week he was saying his goodbye to his mom and dad. And in order to get to this place where my nephew was, I had to walk through the cancer ward of a children's hospital. I was so mad at the devil. I was walking through that thing. I said, God, your love is so secure. It's so strong. So I started walking because I'm a pastor, so I can do this. I started walking in the hospital room, and I said, excuse me, do you need prayer? And these big moms, you know, they, they were there all night. You could tell they were so exhausted. They'd look up, and they'd say, of course we need prayer. 
and I'd start praying for them, and I'd start just saying, you, the love of God is chasing you down. You can't run from the love of God. It's overwhelming you. They'd start crying. They'd start crying, and the children would say, oh, you, sir, you don't know, I, I feel this fire in my stomach. I believe with all of my being that those children were healed. I believe we're going to see doctor's reports of it. No, God wants to give you hope this afternoon. There's hope for you. No matter what you've been through, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what the doctor's report was, no matter what the credit card bill said, there's hope for you this afternoon. Receive the hope of the Lord. For no one who puts their hope in the Lord will ever be put to shame. Father, we trust you. We trust your word. And Father, we stand this morning and this afternoon fully persuaded of your reckless love manifesting in our life. And the people of God said, amen, amen and amen. Be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, hallelujah, look at all of you. Worship team, you guys were just off the charts. <laughs> You need to do a CD. We've got to get that stuff pumping out to the airwaves. You know, it's funny, whenever you meet Christians, uh, especially musicians, they're always so shy. Have you noticed that? It's like, oh, no, I don't know mine. Listen, Hollywood is pumping out as much garbage as they can. It's time the church start pumping out some of our sound. Our sound brings life. I'm serious. You guys need to start writing. Use your gifts and your talents. I, um, I've got a word that I believe is going to wreck you this afternoon, and then Katie's going to come and clean up tonight, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I can do that. She, you know, she's, she's like my sister. Uh, both of us, our, our mom is Patricia King. How many know Patricia King? Yeah. Oh, they know her here. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that's not always good, I found out. <laughs> it's good for us. We, we love her, and um, she's in Toronto right now. Actually, I've been speaking to her all week, and... Uh, so we're, we're brother and sister, you know, we, we get to do life together, and uh, we are opening our U.S. base in Maricopa, where her U.S. base is, so we're going to be right in Arizona next door to each other, and we're going to do life together, and uh, you're going to, you really want to be here tonight to hear her preach, and I don't just mean, I mean, it takes a lot to, impre uh, to impress me with someone's preaching, but she is one of my favorite preachers in the whole wide world, I mean that, so you're going to, you're going to, you're going to get a good dose and uh, if you don't, we'll give you a, a refund. It's free evenings. <laughs> uh, I am um, the border had a tough time letting my product come across because uh, they loved it so much. I guess the border guards wanted to keep it all. Um, they might need it. But I have developed a series um, when I first started my church. I started a church two years ago, um, and it was the last thing I ever wanted to do in the entire world. I had pastored before five years ago, and it was the worst experience of my entire life. I never knew how bad sheep could bite. <laughs> I mean, they're messy sheep, you know, like they go to the bathroom, and sheep have baby sheep, and sheep get older and cranky, and I, I, and I was 19 years old. I'm thinking, this is bad news, Charlie Brown. <laughs> and I remember walking into our, our first assignment. Maravik and I, my wife, and we walked in this church. It was downtown Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, in the middle of the ghetto. Is somebody from there? Are you from Hamilton? Near. Where are you from? Toronto. Good, good. Okay. Well, I was in Hamilton, downtown in the ghetto, where all the prostitutes and the drug dealers were. So we're driving there. And uh, actually, we weren't driving because I didn't have a license yet. My mother-in-law was driving me there. <laughs> That's the truth. And uh, I'm going to take my first assignment. So I get, I get into this church, and there's about five uh, people sitting in the pews on Sunday morning. And I'm going, oh, I guess they're doing like a pre-service leaders meeting or something. Uh, no, it was the congregation. <laughs> and there was literally holes in the ceiling of the building. And the Lord spoke to me instantaneously. He said, John, you're going to be here until this building is paid off, that every seat is full, and the roof is completely renovated. And I looked at my wife right then and there. I said, Maravik, we're going to die here. <laughs> That's where my faith was. <laughs> I just I thought, boy, this is where we're going to give the rest of our life. And uh, so we started pastoring this Filipino church uh, that didn't speak hardly any English. And... Um, they seemed to really like me, I think because they couldn't understand anything I was saying. 
And uh, I just kept going on the streets, evangelizing. We'd open our church hours. Our church office hours were from 7.30 at night till 2 o'clock in the morning. Because that was our clientele, you know. That's, that's, they were downtown. And uh, they weren't up early in the morning. And prostitutes were coming in our church. And we were feeding them soup and having hot towels. And they were coming in. And drug dealers were coming in. And we started seeing drug dealers and prostitutes come to the Lord. And um, th- my, f- my salary uh, for being full-time in the ministry was $500 a month. That's what my wife and I got for being full-time pastors. And that was like, I mean, we used to have to pay to do ministry. So this was a bonus. <laughs> you know, someone was paying me to preach. This is amazing. And uh, so we, we weren't making it financially. So I had to get a, a, a secular job. And I worked at a call center for, um, for a, a phone company. And I would call and listen to people complain about their bills all day. I mean, none of you would ever do that, you know, I know. But, you know, people are like, why is there a $2 charge on my statement? And, and you know, I'd have to deal with all these things. And, and so I would just try to exercise the love of God. But all these Muslims were in my, were in my workplace. And, uh, and they were going and getting paid time off to go and do their prayer time. Well, I was a Christian. So I went to my boss and I said, well, I'm a Christian. I want to get paid five times to go and pray a day. He says, well, your religion doesn't believe that. I said, well, no, we should be constantly in prayer. <laughs> Right? And so um, I, I, they said, well, we'll let you start a half an hour up uh, club uh, that's paid. So anybody in, in Bell Canada who wants to go and pray can come with you and you'll do a, a corporate prayer meeting. Well, there was no other born again Christians in the work. But when I announced that they would get a paid half hour off if they came to pray, suddenly everybody was spirit filled. Shaka more glande. And everybody would pack in that room, and I would be the only person speaking in tongues. And I'd go, shaka ramba roso toro rara ramba. And then people were looking. But they were just happy not to be on the phones for half an hour. Well, all of a sudden, they started getting saved. We saw over 200 salvations in Bell Canada. They had to open up 16 different prayer times throughout the day because they couldn't accommodate all the people in our little staff room. And this is when I was 20 years old. So our church was growing, but we were broke, and um, we just had no money. And so we, and we were taking care of the poor and the prostitutes and everything. And I remember um, this one Sunday in particular, and it was Testimony Sunday. You know what Testimony Sunday is, don't you? When everybody brags on how much stuff they have and what you don't have. <laughs> and it was the worst Sunday ever as the pastor, because I had to sit there, and they'd come up and they'd say, oh! Praise the Lord, Pastor. This week, my husband got a $50,000 bonus. And I know they ain't tithing. Mm-hmm, I know. And, and, and I would get so mad. I'm sitting there, and Maverick says, smile. You look so sour. And I'd be like, oh, hallelujah. And the next person would come and say, oh, praise the Lord. We were able to buy our son a brand new Mercedes Benz for graduating high school. Oh my God. And Maverick and I were taking the city bus. Have you ever felt like, why is everybody else around me getting blessed? (laughs) Like, why isn't everybody else getting promoted? Everybody else has a testimony. Everybody else has a story. But here I am in the middle of the ghetto with a broken down church, and I got nothing. And I got so upset. So I went home that Sunday afternoon and uh, turned on the TV, and I thought, I'm just going to have a veg day, Pastor. That's what I thought. I'm just going to sit down and veg. And on comes Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. And my remote ran out of batteries. I couldn't flick the channel. I, and I didn't know what kind of spirit was in my remote control because I was so mad. But I was too lazy to get up and turn it off. So I sat there. I'm just getting mad. I'm just watching. And, you know, he's telling this story of Christmas. And maybe you've heard it. They were walking in the mall, this mall, Gloria and him. And they were walking one end. And um, he, he says, Gloria, watch this. Watch what's going to happen. And she says, well, he goes, I didn't bring any money. And she said, what? He go, and she, he says, I didn't bring any money to the mall. She goes, well, how are we going to do our Christmas shop? She says, the Lord told me he's just going to take care of it. And I got so mad. I got so mad. I thought, you got money. Bring your money. You know, let the people give me money. <laughs> and uh, he says, we were walking down the halfway to the mall, and this brother comes up running out of J.C. Penney. He says, Brother Copeland, Brother Copeland, running out of the store like this. And you could just picture Ken the Copeland telling the story. And he says, do you, do you own a Bentley? And, I, and he says, oh, no, sir, I don't own a Bentley. He goes, the Lord told me to give you my Bentley. Oh my I was so insulted. I mean, the guy's already got tons of cars. He doesn't need a Bentley. I need a Bentley, Katie. I need a bicycle. You know, I need something. 
And then Gloria says, well, Kenneth, that's nothing. I was walking the other side of the mall waiting for you and doing whatever you were doing. And this lady came up to me. She says, Gloria Copeland, I didn't know you go into shopping malls. And she says, well, where else would I buy my clothes? <laughs> and she says, well, the Lord told me to write you a check for $250,000. You buy whatever you want. This lady who owns an oil well was just shopping in the mall and saw her. Saw her. They left the mall that day with a Bentley and over $400,000 in checks for them personally. Wow. Well, I was so mad that I could almost cuss. <laughs> but I was a minister. We can't do that. <laughs> and, I, and I was so mad. I just stood up and I just thought, these prosperity preachers. <laughs> and uh, the Lord spoke to me. He says, John, until you learn to celebrate other people's testimonies... You'll never have your own. And until you come to realize what I want to give you, you're, you're never ever going to have possession of it. And I said, well, what is that supposed to mean? He said, every time you hear about somebody else's testimony, I want you to holler. I said, what? He said, I want you to stand up and say, praise the Lord. I said, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> so that... That evening, a friend of mine calls me. He says, I'm going to catch the fire Toronto for a meeting. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, they bark like dogs over there. And, uh, and he, says, he says, yeah, you'll love it. I said, I don't think so. And he says, well, I was set free that day. And this is a testimony. And what did the Lord tell me to do? Praise the Lord. <laughs> he said, oh, does that mean you're coming? I said, I guess so. So we go, the, we go to catch the fire that night. They're lined up at the altar all to give their testimony. I have to stand up after each one and go, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I was so mad. <laughs> like, I was so angry. And, and so at the end of it, John Arnott gets up, and, you know, he gets up, and he's in his little Hawaiian shirt, and looks like he's about to go off to Barbados or something. And, and he comes up, and he says, uh, more, Lord. And they all go, ha, 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 ha. And I'm going, Somebody's drinking the Kool-Aid around here. <laughs> and John Arnott came right up to me. He says, why do you look so sour? More, Lord. And also my insides came all on fire, and I started jumping up and down like a bunny. <laughs> so I, came, I went home that night, and I had to explain to my wife how I got filled with the Spirit, like really filled with the Spirit. And uh, so I come home. And my wife is in bed, and, and I'm, I, you know, our bedroom was downstairs. I was living in my in-law's house, which is you know, a shameful thing when you marry an Asian family. So we're in our in-law's house. I'm going down the stairs, and all I can hear is this outrageous laughter. And I'm going, what is that noise? You know, that sounds like my wife. Is she okay? So I'm going down. Merivik's on the ground in the bed, wrapped in the sheets, rolling around, laughing her head off in the basement. And I'm going, what happened? Are you Okay. Like, were you drinking? You know, <laughs> I didn't know what else. I mean, I didn't know we don't drink, but I, who knows? You know, something crazy is going on. She says, the, the Lord told me that our key to breakthrough is to laugh at it. I said, laugh at what? She goes, everything. <laughs> so I just decided I had enough, so I went to the couch. And I sat down thinking, God, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying to mess you up. Because your mentality has been blocking your blessing. You see, uh, people say, well, are you a prosperity preacher? And I say, well, I tried poverty. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> and they say, well, so are you, are you a prosperity preacher? And I say, well, I'm a provision preacher. I believe that God provides more than enough. Amen. People say, well, are you word of faith? I said, well, I tried being word of doubt. They said, well, do you name it and claim it? I said, I name it, I claim it, I blab it and grab it, and I march around it seven times. <laughs> Why? Because I have something you don't. Because I learned to blab it and grab it and name it and claim it and march around it seven times because I changed my stinking thinking. Come on. Yes. And when I changed my stinking thinking, I broke free from a life that the enemy... See, the enemy wants you to have a little bit of breakthrough and for you to maintain that. 
As long as you can't get your real breakthrough and just get the thrill and the goosebump and cry a little bit during worship, you'll get a little bit of breakthrough, you'll think it's really God, but God has something so much more, something bigger, because according to Ephesians 3.20, God can do far more than you could think for, ask for, or even imagine in your wildest dreams. He does it not by forcing you, but by his spirit deeply within you. Which means it's a process to come out. And many people settle for their little bit of victory and their little bit of breakthrough, and they give up on believing for the increase. I believe the reason why I was under such an attack this week is because I came this weekend to break this atmosphere open for you. I believe the reason why, three days ago I couldn't talk. No, I was in the hospital. The doctor said to me, you, you, you've got pneumonia. Pneumonia. I was on an IV. And I said, well, I'm going to Pennsylvania. And then I'm going to New York City. And then I'm going, and I said, you know, these are things that the Lord has told me I have to do. And he says, well, unless the Lord does something in your body, you are not, I'm not releasing you to fly. I'm, uh, this, is, this is three days ago. Yesterday morning, I wake up, I can talk. I wasn't, like, I was collapsing. I couldn't, I didn't know where I was. I was fine. I get on my plane. I travel all day yesterday. I miss my connection. And, and then the lady says to me, there is no plane that can get you to Pennsylvania in time. That's what she said to me last night. You'll have to just go to directly to New York. I said, I am going to Pennsylvania. I don't care if I have to wait all night, but you are going to get me a seat. And she says, oh, wait, a seat just opened in business class. Why? Because your opposition is just making way for your promotion. There's a reason that I came to this region. There's a reason that we're here. It's because the atmosphere is about to shift. Something's about to change in your life. And if you don't believe it, then you won't receive it. If this is just another charismatic, make me feel good message, you're just going to get another dose of the charismatic, make me feel good message. But if you really need a breakthrough, you're going to get a breakthrough. Good, good. Twelve of you are excited. <laughs> and, and so I started, I was in um, Kelowna. And I'm sitting down with my wife and we moved from pastoring. The, the whole church building, by the way, got completely paid for. The mortgage got completely paid for. Not one dollar came from the church. Secular businessmen saw what we were doing to transform the city. And they said, we've never seen a church doing what you're doing. We want to pay for your church. It's called reformation. Mm -hmm. See, in revival, everybody has to come to the church. In reformation, the church goes to the city. There's a concept that we're going to learn about this afternoon. We're going to break it down for you because there's something that the Lord has shown me about a coming transfer of power in the church that's going to set you free. So we, we finished paying off the building. The church is growing. Everything's doing wonderful. And the Lord said, okay, it's time for you to go. I said, go, it's just getting good. <laughs> like I'm finally not having to, you know, work three jobs to make a living. And the Lord said, John, have I ever failed you? I said, well, it's come close, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, you know. <laughs> Eating popcorn for four days wasn't that much fun, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like I grew up in the ghetto. Uh, we, we weren't rich growing up. Uh, we lived in the ghetto. We had to go and boil our hot water so we could take a shower. Wow. You know, at Christmas time, we didn't have no turkey. We had spam. That was our dinner. And we go to the food bank, they give us moldy bread, we'd cut the mold around the bread and still eat the bread. Bunch of wimps, just cut the mold off and eat it. <laughs> and I mean, so I, I, I was, I, boy, I used to get mad at all this stuff. And then the Lord says, have I ever let you down? I said, well, you come close, but no, we're still here, you know, we're, we're good. He says, okay, because I've got a really big assignment for you. I said, oh, what is it, Lord? Is it Africa? <laughs> I want to go to Africa. <laughs> he says, you're going to go to Edmonton. I said, Edmonton? He's like, yes, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. One of the coldest places in the entire nation. I said, why would I ever go to Edmonton? He says, because I have a very special assignment for you and your wife. I said, what is it, Lord? Speak, your servant is listening. He said, you're going to go and sell things door to door. I said, excuse me? He said, yes, it's going to be great fun. He lying. <laughs> we packed up all of, we had all that we owned, made it into two suitcases. We get on a plane, buy a one-way ticket, go to Edmonton, and this company called Vivint 
home automation security systems. We don't have a clue what we're doing. This is just like a week, and we pull this all together. We show up, and this Mormon guy comes to the front. He says, welcome to the Mormon Vivint. I'm like, what? <laughs> he says, your job is to work from 6 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, going door to door, six days a week, because they weren't allowed to work on their Sabbath, selling home automation systems, and all they do is drop you off in a subdivision, and they pick you up in the evening, and I have a wife, and, you have to, and if you have to use the bathroom, you have to knock on somebody's door and ask if you can use their bathroom. Wow. Well, that was pretty humbling. So my wife says, oh, this is going to be so much fun. Well, I wasn't thinking those words. <laughs> and it was only commission, so you weren't guaranteed to make anything. And so um, we start our first day, and I'm just so mad at God. I'm so mad at everything that's happening in my entire life. And I'm just thinking, you know, see, nothing can go right for me. And I'm from a divorced family, and this is what I get. And I'm never going to become anything. I'm meh, 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 meh. And uh, I know none of you ever think that. And uh, I was just operating like a victim. I was actually operating worse than a victim. I was operating like a slave. And I just kept, well, I just got to do this. I just got to do this so because, you know, we got to get something. It's better than nothing. And Merivik was doing this. Well, Merivik became the top seller, <laughs> making $15,000 a week. I, I became the nothing seller. <laughs> <laughs> I would just, I would be so worried about Merivik, I would follow her to make sure she was okay. And she'd say, stop following me, sell something. <laughs> and I'd say, no, I don't know if you're going to be okay because she's by herself. You know, it's 930 at night. It's dark. So I'd be following her and she's like, shh, people are getting creeped out by you. Go away, you know. And, <laughs> and so at the, at the end of that month, I get a call from Wesley Campbell and he says, um, John, I want you to come and pastor my church. I said, no, 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 we've tried pastoring. <laughs> It was bad for them. It was bad for us. Nobody liked it, you know. And uh, he says, no, no, this will be different. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah. So I got on a plane, went to Kelowna, British Columbia. Mayor Vic's at home knocking on doors. And uh, I go to the elders meeting, and they all said to me, we don't know why you're here. We don't want to hire you. I said, hi, nice to meet you, too. My name's John, <laughs> you know. And uh, Wesley says, well, it doesn't look like we can hire you, but um, do, you, do you have a heart for missions? And I said, are you kidding me? Like, that's... We've been on so many missions trips. We've been to Mexico. And when I was 14 years old, I started a, a missions or program that's still running in Canada called the Christmas Dreams Program that helps families that, that, that need at Christmas time. And he says, well, you can run that for us. So I go my first day on the job. Okay, this is a ministry called Be Hero. And I, I show up. And the bookkeeper says to me, who are you? I said, uh, well, my name's John. <laughs> and she goes, uh, I've heard your name. What are you doing here? So well, I've come to run Be Hero. And she goes, oh, really? I said, yeah, why? And she goes, well, just so you know, we have no money. And uh, we give everything we make, we give it to the orphan orphanages. And uh, you don't have a salary. I said, oh. And she says, and there's a, a, a bill coming in from the accountants who did all the work, like the government accountants, for $60,000. And we have no money to pay that either. So since you're the boss, it's your problem. And she says, I'm leaving for the day. Have a good day. She walks out of the office. Wesley's in Korea. And I'm thinking, this is terrible. Like, like, what am I doing here? I need to go back to Merivik and start knocking on doors. <laughs> you know, like, this is bad news. And um, the next day, I get a phone call, and it's my pastor from Ontario that grew up. He says, John, can you come home? I hear you're running Be Hero. There was an article in our Christian magazine that you're the new CEO. I said, What? This is like a day old. He says, can you come? So I come to Ontario. We set up 10 nights of meetings. We raised $1.1 million. <laughs> Every single dollar goes to the orphanages overseas. So now we still have no money for admin. I said, God, what are we going to do about our wages? This one man comes up to me. He says, um, John, I've watched you over the years. He, he, he's grown up with me. He says, and you've been so faithful to the Lord, and you've never stopped doing, being faithful to the ministry. No matter how hard it got, you were faithful. He says, I want to commit for the next 10 years to writing your entire salary off. One man. Wow. I came from the ghetto. <laughs> you can't tell me what God can't do. But there's a slave mentality that exists in us, and it's preventing us from accessing the fullness that God has in store for us. I began this process coming back to Kelowna, and I was working in Be Here. We were traveling the nations. I traveled 200,000 miles a year in the air visiting projects. In the Philippines, we literally rescued two to 12-year-olds from human trafficking. Like two to 12-year-old girls. We have, we have 
over a hundred of them that we rescued from cages, brought them into homes that are forever set free. Come on, give God praise for that. And so life was good, and then um, I, the Lord said to me, John, I want you to do 10 nights of revival meetings in Kelowna. I want you to stir up the prophetic word. And I said, oh, that'd be so much fun. You know, because itinerates, we like doing things for 10 days and then leaving, you know, 10 days the max. <laughs> and uh, so I said, sure, we can do that. So 10, 10 days, we, we call these revival meetings. Well, there's people lined up around the hotel to get in. And I'm going, where did all these people come from? You know, there's not enough room for everybody. We moved to a bigger space, 500 people a night. And it's just growing and growing and growing. The Lord says, I want you to go another 10 days. I said, I can't. You know, I have, I have places to be. He says, cancel your whole schedule. And I said, okay, Lord. So I just did what he was telling me. So we went for 21 days. And I really believe there's something about 21 days that brings you to a breakthrough, by the way. Uh, uh, John chapter 21, when they're fishing. There's a whole story there. We'll, we'll touch on that tomorrow morning. But I, I remember going through this whole process. And then the last day of the meeting, uh, people kept saying, are you, are you starting a church? I said, no, no. No, I would never start a church. You've got to be crazy to start a church. No offense. And, um, <laughs> and I, I, like, you've got like, you, you to have some serious mental health problems. And because uh, I was just so frustrated by the whole system. And, and all these people were saying, well, if this became a church, this would be my church. I said, well, I wouldn't be your pastor. And, uh, like, you've got issues, and I've got issues. And, and so I, I, I said to Maravik, I said, I've got to leave. I need to go to the Philippines to look at my kids because... This is confusing. So I got on a plane. I went to the Philippines, and I went to go and play with orphans for five days. And it was the most fun I had. Because they don't talk back to you. You know, they don't, like, well, can I see your theology certificate? They don't do that. They just play and eat and poop, you know. And so I'm just playing with them, and I'm flying back, and I'm, I'm quite tired because I was spending all these days with them. And the Lord says to me, he says, John, um, when you get back home to Kelowna, I, I want you to do something. I said, no, Lord, I know what you're going to ask me to do. I won't do it. And he says, you don't even know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I said, I know what you're going to say. He says, I want you to start a church. I said, please, Lord, I'll go, I'll go to Alaska. <laughs> you know, like anything but that. And he said, here's what he said to me still to this day. He says, John, if you go back home and you start a church, it will be the greatest thing that you offer back up to me when you get to heaven. Amongst all your ministry, amongst all that you do for the poor, amongst all your itinerant ministry, if you would go back and commit to do life with people, if you would do life with people, not just preach at people, if you would do life with people, it would be the greatest thing you offer back up to me when you get to heaven. So I came home, I said to Maravik, I said, um, I think we should start a cell group. And she says, okay, only for 10 weeks. I said, okay, well, I mean, 10 weeks, the Lord can do a lot in 10 weeks. And I've learned with my wife, you just, whatever she takes, you just take it. You know, like she says, 10, oh, 10's great, hallelujah, 10's perfect. Don't push the envelope. <laughs> and so for 10 weeks... The, the, our home group grew to like 240 people. We couldn't fit our home, so we had to rent a hotel room for our home group. And on the ninth week, she says, well, aren't you going to tell them this is the last week? I said, well, why don't you make the announcement? She says, no, I couldn't do that. Those people would be so hurt. I said, well, what do you think we should do? And she said, well, I guess we should start a church. <laughs> and uh, to this day, you know, this, we just celebrating our second year anniversary. The church is growing leaps and bounds. We've seen over 700 first-time salvations in 12 months. 700 first-time salvations. Our Facebook church is exploding. We have 23,000 people uh, every single week turning in, over 50,000 every single month that are tuning in from around the nations. People who have been so hurt and broken by the church coming in. Now, how did we get to this process? And I wanna, this is what I want to get to uh, because we're going to dive in is, boy, it's 320 right now. That's my favorite number in the whole day because um, I'm not usually up at 320 in the morning. Uh, there's, there's a process that we came to. As soon as I started the church, the Lord said, John, you're going to get a lot of the wounded, broken, prophetic tribe. Now, I know you're not any of those people. But, but there's been a lot of people that have been hurt and rejected and called Jezebel. And I mean, you name it, they've been through it. They've been through the ringer. And he says, and the Lord spoke to me, you're going to get a lot of those people. And I want you to spend the next eight Sundays going through what I'm about to give you. And he downloaded to my spirit something called Soul Detox. He said, I want you to detox their soul. And, um, I mean, you can, 
listen to my life story on, on it, but I, I mean, my mom was addicted to prescription medication, dated the Hells Angels. I saw her have multiple partners. I've seen, uh, my, my dad used to physically abuse me because I believed in Jesus when I became a believer. Uh, I mean, I went through a horrific past, grew up in poverty, uh, uh, just long story after long story. And so I developed a teaching set because the Lord spoke to me after we did this for the church. He said, I want you to give this to the body so that they can go through. Because here's the, the thing about inner healing. I, how many have done sozo, ancient paths, you know, inner healing? You, I mean, you, you do all these different kinds. I, I've done so many different kinds. But the problem with me is, like, you know, they get to something, and it may not be an issue in my life, but they get to, like, gluttony. <laughs> that, that's, that, they, I need to spend a few more weeks on that one. Like, you need something that goes at your own pace and that you're not paying by the minute. Because, you know, I have spent thousands of dollars paying by the hour for inner healing. And the Lord spoke to me, says, John, I want you to develop a whole series where leaders and the body of Christ can get healed and set free and delivered at their own pace. This is the important part. So I, I, I developed this teaching. Uh, I, the first thing I talk about is how to recognize if you're emotionally unhealthy. Now, if you think you're emotionally healthy, you're probably not. That's the first sign. You look at that. You all pass. The second sign is the root of bitterness. I talk about the root of bitterness, the fear of man. I spend almost four and a half hours talking about dealing with disappointment. How do you deal with it? How do you deal with it in your soul? I talk about dealing with discontentment, the master of greed, and breaking the spirit of heaviness over your home, your marriage, your finances, and your personal life. Uh, so it's over 20 hours of teaching. Now, we couldn't get this across the border. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. And I, I'm just going to announce this to you. Anybody who, there's only 20 left in Kelowna, by the way. Okay, so we can only sell 20 sets at the back because I, I mean, I could oversell them to you and overpromise and never deliver, but I'm not going to do that to you. There's 20 sets left in Kelowna. You can buy them at the back after the service. And I'm going to include, because I feel like the Lord spoke to me, uh, I was telling the ladies, I'm going to include one hour of a free inner healing appointment with our counselors in Kelowna. So you, you can just call the office and schedule in, but I'm going to give you one hour free inner healing, plus you can get the CDs and the DVDs, and they're going to give you the downloads. It's usually $299 for the course. We're going to give it to you for $99. I just want to sew it into you. So you can go to the back after the service and register for that. Don't, don't do it now. You know, they'll, they'll be there. But they're going to take 20 people to do that. And I want to sew this into you because I feel like many of you have been through disappointing circumstances. You have discontentment, and you have, you have a spirit of heaviness that you need to be broken over your life. Amen? Is that some of you? Yeah, so I wanted to pick this up, and maybe uh, we want to give one to the church, too. So just give them your information so you have one for here at the church. I want to give that to you afterwards. Open your Bibles, if you don't mind, please, to Exodus chapter 5. Yes, please. Thank you. Are you okay out there? Are you sure? Am I boring you yet? Oh, darn. I was hoping it would be an early meeting. Proverbs 30:22. Can we, uh, let me turn the, Exodus, we're going to go to Exodus 5, but also Proverbs 30:22. Amen. Got a good word for you. Proverbs 30, verse 22. Say amen if you're there. Uh, we'll start in 21, actually. Under three, thir three things the earth trembles. Under four it cannot bear up. Verse 22. When a slave becomes a king. A servant who becomes a king. A slave who becomes a king. That actual translation of servant, when you break it down, is someone who is in slavery. Now, the Lord showed this verse to me, and he said, John, you want to know why we have so much trouble in the church? It's because we've got a whole bunch of Christians that are becoming kings of the earth, but they still think like slaves. And that slave mentality has carried them through their entire life and has literally hindered them from becoming the leader, the spouse, the parent, the, the, the believer that they're destined to be, to, to be and called to be. And there is this, this thing that happens to us, and you've seen them. You've seen them. You can just you know, Google terrible things that have happened in the church, but you've seen these people who have come to a place of power, but they still fought like a slave. 
You can think of people in your own life. You know people that have leadership positions or maybe they're, they're involved in high-level places in government and they still think like a slave. Well, what does a slave mentality think like? We're going to go through that this, this afternoon. The, the concern that the Lord has given to me about this is that people don't even know that they're still thinking like slaves. And I'm concerned that in the church today, as believers, we've limited God and we've limited the power within us because we are still fighting for straw. Exodus chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And I will not let Israel, Israel go. F verse 4. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you are stopping them from working. I have come to realize that when the body of Christ has tried to come into their destiny and their call, somebody says, what are you doing trying to set them free? Some of the most attacked ministries on the planet today are inner healing and deliverance ministries. Why? Because we're trying to get you set free, and the, and the devil doesn't want you set free, and they say, what are you doing? The church says to those ministries, what are you doing? That's false teaching. That's garbage teaching. Don't do that. Stop wasting our time. Stop teaching our people that because they know that what the devil knows how powerful you would be if you got set free. Some of the greatest ministries that are the most tacked on the earth today are the word of faith ministries that are trying to teach people how to live by faith in the word, and yet they've been the most persecuted out of any other ministry on the entire earth. Why? Because the devil doesn't want you to become prosperous. And you see a cycle that's happening that's the same cycle as in the Old Testament that ever since the days of Egypt, the enemy has not wanted you to experience freedom in the fullness. And now through Christ, when we can have freedom, the church sometimes is stopping us from having freedom. Your husband might be saying, well, what are you doing going to that sozo? You don't need that sozo. <laughs> what are you doing listening to reading that stuff? What are you doing listening to that soul stuff? I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm becoming a better person. I'm becoming all that I can be in Christ. I'm actually taking the blood of Jesus and I'm applying it to my life in a tangible way so I can become and walk in the fullness of Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why are you stopping them from working? Get back on your heads. Keep performing. You've got a job to do. You have responsibilities to do. You don't have time to dream. You don't have time to worry about going to conferences. Get back to work. Even in recent political slogans in America, you hear, we're going to get America back to work. Well, how about we get America back to dreaming? America back to hoping. America back to being healed. America back to having their kids not in the streets getting shot. That same day, say the same day. Verse 6. Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Have you ever felt like the straw was taken away from you? Like you had a word from the Lord. I know this. I know this happens to me all the time. The Lord says to me, John, I want you to go on TV ministry. I said, oh, yes, Lord. I go in the next day. A donor calls and says, oh, we, we, we used to give $100,000 a year, but we're going to cancel our donation. The same day. It's like you get an assignment from the Lord, you get a call from the Lord, and you're like, yes, I can do this. And the same day, your straw is taken away, but you're required to make the same amount of bricks. Am I talking to anybody? And you go through the same cycle of slavery through your entire life. I just got to make enough to pay off my mortgage so that when I'm 65, my house will be paid off so that I can sell it so that I can live. And we have people stuck on a slave cycle in the church. 
We have people stuck in a system that is teaching them, well, you know, if you try dreaming, we're going to take your straw away. If you try hoping, if you try starting a business, it's going to fail, and you're taught to fear success. This isn't something new. It's not a new thing for the church. God's people went through this in slavery. Do you understand there's a common theme here? The enemy doesn't want you to dream. He doesn't want you to break open the new dimensions. He doesn't want you to have the breakthrough. The same day. Boy, have I felt like it's been the same day. But require them to make the same number of bricks. Just keep working. Well, my marriage is falling apart. Doesn't matter. Keep working. But my son's going through hell. Just keep working. Then the slave drivers. Sorry, um, verse 9. <clears throat> 8. But require them to make the number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. This is why they're crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they can keep working and pay no attention to the lies. We want to distract you from having to dream. If we can make you so hopeless and so sucked into a system, then you won't have time to think of something better. Verse 10, then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the, verse 12, so the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. When you go and study in history, you actually find out that 10% of the Jews died in the period of this law. I thought, well, this is interesting. Why? 10% of the Jews died because they would actually kill each other over the stubble. So their work would be easier. And all of a sudden, we see in Egypt now, not only do they facing Egypt, but now they're turning to fight inwards against each other. Does it sound familiar, church? Are you getting the drift? And now we start to tear each other. Well, you're successful. You can't be more successful. Well, how can you get nice things? I should have nice things. And we start to attack people in our own family. Then those slave drivers went out and said, this is what Pharaoh says. I'll not give you any more. Verse 13, the slave drivers kept pressing them. Have you felt pressed? Just keep doing it. Just keep going. Verse 14, and Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers that they had appointed, demanding, why haven't you met your quota? What's wrong with you? Then the Israelite overseer went and appealed to Pharaoh, why are you treating us this way? Verse 16, your servants are given no straw, yet we're told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is your own people. And verse 17, Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are. Lazy. I want to rebuke the lie that some of you have believed for a very long time that you are lazy. You are a child of God and children of God are not lazy. They're, Christians are some of the most hardworking people I've ever met in my entire life. They come to church and they serve. They go to work and they serve. They raise their families and they serve. You are some of the most upstanding citizens in the entire universe. The Christians of the United States of America have provided more aid and more missions funding and more disaster relief funding than any other government on the entire planet for the history. You are not lazy people. Come on. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm not lazy. I'm not lazy. No, God say it with some spunk. <laughs> I'm not lazy. Verse 19, the Israel overseers realized they were in trouble. <laughs> ah, this is bad news, Charlie Brown. You are not to reduce the number of bricks required for you each day. Verse 20, when they left Pharaoh, they found Moses. You better believe they were looking for Moses. <laughs> you better believe it. And Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials, and they put a sword in their hand to kill us. The Lord told me when he gave me this message, he said, John, people will try to kill you to stop you from preaching this message. Because you're going to break a system mentality that's in the church today. It's happened. I preached this 
in New York City, and there was a politician there. He says, you can't preach this message. I said, I can preach whatever the Bible says. He says, if the church starts actually doing what you're talking about, it would change society. I said, that's the goal, Sherlock. <laughs> he said, but that would mean you guys would become the most powerful people in the culture. I said, bingo. <laughs> Wait, and he says, but that means you would start making the laws. Hello, now you're playing with fire. See, they want you to stay in the building. They don't mind if you hoop and holler and shout and jump up and down and give lots of money as long as it's done in the building. But you start building the hospitals. You start saying to the school board, hey, we'll wipe out your debt. They're going to have some issue with that. Because let me tell you, America, you don't need no reminder, but you are in a culture war. And in a culture war, whoever speaks up loudest gets to shape the culture. And somehow in the last decade, the church has become the church of the jellyfish. No spines. We're so sorry. We're so sorry. Did we offend you? We're so sorry. I celebrate Christmas. I put up a Christmas tree. I am anti-abortion. I believe in life. And I don't care what anybody else says about it. And I tell people. I was just on a plane with a very powerful man. He says to me, John, I can't believe you evangelicals. You actually, you would want us to make laws stopping abortion? I said, duh. <laughs> like the protests haven't shown you anything? He says, there's just not enough of you doing it. There have been plans that other people have, other people groups, I don't want to name them, that have been installed for years, and their whole plan was, let's get the people to the top of society so that society accepts what we do and we'll make laws around it. But while we've been acting like victims, fighting over straw, the enemy's been having tactics and strategies of how to take our nation. Am I hitting something close to home? they come after Moses. Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord? <laughs> why me? <laughs> why have you brought trouble on these people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's brought trouble on the people and you've, you've not rescued us at all. Have you ever felt like that? Like, God, I'm just trying to do what you told me to do. And every time I try to do what you tell me to do, I just get attacked. I get beat up. I get slandered. I can never do it right. <laughs> Just ask my husband, he'll tell you. Just ask my wife, <laughs> right? Exodus 16. No, we'll go, to, uh, we'll go to 14. Fourteen verse 10. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said, Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Why have you done, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egypts, Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. What you're looking at is a bunch of people that think their freedom isn't worth their death. Wow. And they'd rather be kept in slavery for generations than be free people because they didn't understand what they were missing out on. Until you understand what an actual free life in Christ looks like, until you understand that you don't have to live under a system or worried about, is the bill collector going to call today? I used to live like that. I used to worry about that. I used to worry about, oh my goodness, what are they going to come after? We, I mean, we were so broke. I'm telling you the truth. When Maravik and I were first married, we had so much debt that we had a, a, a fish, fish pole, you know, like those gold, you put goldfish in. And we, we'd write all the creditors we owed money to, and we'd fold their names in it. And I'd tell them, we don't have enough money to pay you all, but I'm going to draw one of your names every month. That's what I said, and we'll just pay whatever we can. And I said, and if you're mean to me on the phone or you keep calling us, I'm going to take your name out of the bowl. <laughs> and they'd say to me, oh, we're so sorry, Mr. Perks. Leave our name in the bowl. 
Uh, there was names I took out. And every month on the 20th when we got our paycheck, I'd draw a name. It'd be like, you know, C- CBC Capital. I said, okay, they're getting our $200. That's how I, I had to live like that. I had to live with repo people coming to our door as a child. When my dad couldn't afford rent or eviction notices on our door. I know what it's like to live in that kind of slavery. I know what it's like to have to line up at the soup kitchen or wait on Christmas and maybe they're going to come and drop off a meal for you. You are not meant to live like that. You're not meant to wait in the mail. I wonder when my social security check's going to come. There is a life of freedom. Jesus says, I came to give you life and life more abundantly, not more locked up. Either the Bible's true or it's not. You've gotten all quiet on me. Until you realize what's at risk, you'll be willing to be led back to Egypt time and time again. And when you go back to Egypt, remember this, it never just takes you, it takes your generation. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Uh, Well, because they're chasing us, and they're about to kill us, and they're really bad, and they're really scary, and they got chariots, and all these people are looking at me, and the Lord says, what's it got to do with me? Uh, Well, you kind of brought us here. And I feel like some of you had had that response from God, and you're just like, well, what do you mean, what does it have to do with you? The whole reason I'm in this mess is because of you. The whole reason I went on this path to get healed or this path to become prosperous or this path to find peace is because I was following your word and now they're coming after me and I'm stuck in the waters there and oh my goodness, what am I supposed to do? And the Lord says, what's that got to do with me? Because he's trying to get you to activate your faith. Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hands over the sea to divide the water. Can you imagine witnessing that miracle? I wish there was a soundtrack. You imagine like if I was one of these, I'd be like, yeah, that's what's up. That's my God. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if I was a scared, like, ooh, maybe they're following us. You know, come on, children. <laughs> Little faster, husband. Keep it going. The game's on tomorrow too. You know, let's keep going. And God comes and the enemy comes down and they get in. And now I'm sure like, okay, the enemy's in the water. How come the water, how come they're allowed in? But you have to believe that God's got your back. You have to believe that it's going to be okay. Are you with me still? Turn your Bibles, Numbers 11. I'm going to close. I'm a preacher, I get four closings. It's like pilots, we're making our descent, we're going to prepare the cabin. We're going to ask the flight attendants to please come around. Verse 4. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Time out. Are you a bunch of losers? Like, what are you talking about? What do you mean at no cost? You were slaves. Of course there was a cost. When you start on your journey of actually becoming free in Christ, you're going to look back on what you used to have. You think, well, it used to be so much more easier. I used to have this. I used to have that. It used to taste good. I had it for free. I never had to worry about it. And now I have to work hard, and I have to, like, believe God, and I have to exercise my faith, and I don't know if I like all of that. People sometimes look at me and say, oh, that faith stuff, that's easy. Are you kidding me? We have to believe God for $300,000 every single month just to meet the minimum needs of our ministry. That's not easy. But I tell you what happened. I had to first learn how to believe God for $500 every single month. And then when I started saying, okay, God, just take the 500 bucks. Here it is. It's just not my problem. It's your problem. Then I started believing God for $1,000, then $5,000. And now we literally believe God for $300,000 every single month. That takes some faith muscle. You think this is fat? No, no, it's all muscle. <laughs> it's spirit muscle. Katie's looks different. It's just a different manifestation. <laughs> She's still got it. <laughs> if only we had the meat to eat wailing 
We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost and the cucumbers. Time out. Who remembers cucumbers? <laughs> it's like kale. <laughs> <laughs> melons. Okay, I, I can understand melons. Okay. Leeks. Oh, leeks. You really? That's what you're going to complain about? Leeks? Like not the chocolate or the maple syrup or the honey, the leeks? And the onions? I mean, garlic I get. I mean, garlic, of course. Bam, spice it up a notch. But I don't understand these leeks and onions. Like they're complaining about this stuff that really doesn't matter. But now we've lost our appetite and we never see anything about this manna. Manna. I always find it interesting, forgive me, that when you come into a new season and how the way the Lord decides to give you your substance and your provision, even though it looks different than your old season, you start to curse the provision he's giving you in this season. Well, man, of, I had, used to have fish and cucumbers and leeks and garlic. And now I got manna. That's the big choice of God, manna. Why does he start giving them manna? Why doesn't he give them a big roast beef supper? He could, he's God. He's developing their faith walk while they leave slavery. You see, you have to still go through the faith walk. Every single one of you must go through the journey of faith. There's not a check that gets written. He doesn't give you the lottery ticket numbers. You don't win some stand-up prize. Here's a million dollars. You go through something called the journey of faith that every single person on this entire planet has to go through. And it's only in the completion of your journey of faith do you get promoted in the spirit realm. I am still on the journey of faith. There's some days I'm on the mountain. Hallelujah. There's some days I'm in the valley. But I've learned to be content by whatever God gives me. If I get manna today, hallelujah. If I get king crab tomorrow, whoo, hallelujah. Are you cursing God's provision in your life today that's leading you out of slavery in your spirit? Or are you cursing it and just, well, I'm, this is garbage. Or are you blessing it? God, thank you for allowing me to participate in this way. Thank you for giving me this seed. Thank you for giving me this bread. See, I, I believe for some of you that your eyes are on Canaan, but your mind is still on Egypt. You, you, you can see the promise. I, I can see it. But you're still thinking like a slave. And you're still fighting, holding all your stuff, and all of it's your stuff and my stuff. And it's not our stuff. It's not shared stuff. It's my stuff and my space on my face and my Twitter. And I, I have a tough time thinking about where God's going to bring us if we can't stop thinking like we're in Egypt. Listen, you've been hurt, I've been hurt, we've all been hurt. But we gotta stop thinking like slaves. I've been wrong, you've been wrong, your pastor's been wrong, we've all been wrong, so let's move on. There's too much at risk for your future for you to hold grudges against the Lord based on what's happened in your past, you need to let it go so you can come into freedom. Amen. I'm talking to somebody. Last scripture, Joshua chapter 17. Can I have somebody come with the keyboard, please? <clears throat> You're doing okay. Hallelujah. Verse 14, 17, Joshua 17, 14. The people of Joseph said to Joshua, why have you given us only one allotment and one portion for an inheritance? We are a numerous people and the Lord has blessed us abundantly. If you are so numerous, Joshua answered, and if the hill country of Ephraim 
is too small for you. Go up into the forest and clear land for yourselves there in the land of the Perizzites and Raphites. The people of Joseph replied, The hill country is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites who live in the plain have chariots fitted with iron. They come to the place where they're actually out of slavery. They're coming into their promise. They're growing and expanding, and they've been given by Moses all the way through a whole section of land. And Joshua's ancestors now have been given this parcel of land, and they're too much, they're growing, they're having babies, they're prosperous, they've got land, they've got resources, and they're saying, it's not enough land, we need more land. And Joshua responds to them and says, well then here's the hill country, go and clear it. And their first response is back to slave days. It's still in their thinking. They say, ah, no, there's bad guys. And they got chariots with iron and they're scary. Why? Because that mentality never left them. It was still in their DNA. And here they are being offered more land. And he's saying, here's the ax, take it and clear it, and it's yours. And they're saying, I'm not sure, it's really scary. Do you know how much land in the spirit is before you right now? Do you know how much is waiting for you and your family? Do you know how much land you can take right now? If you would stop allowing fear and insecurity to rule and reign over your life and you'd become set free from a victim and slave mentality and start to say, no, I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. No weapon formed against me is not going to prosper. It's not going to happen. I am blessed and highly favored. I'm appointed and anointed. I'm commissioned. I'm called. I'm consumed by the call of God. And you start to walk a little different. People said to me, you walk like Patricia King. I said, what are you talking about? I said, I walk like a woman? And then I started watching how Patricia King walks into a room. You never see her. She just gracefully gazes into a room. I've arrived. <laughs> she sits down and she's always looking up. My wife said, you know, John, that's what you do when you walk into a room. You, you have this presence about you. I said, well, I'm not trying to be prideful. It's not because I'm, you know, like, look at me, I've arrived. It's because I know who I am. See, when you know who you are, it changes everything. I'm not the pauper from the ghetto anymore. I'm not who I was. I've been set free. I've been bought by the blood. I don't have to live like I used to live. I don't have to worry about ordering craft dinner. I get to order filet mignon. Why? Because I've been on a path of freedom. I don't think like a slave. I don't think like it's all mine. Well, I better save all my money because, you know, one day there might be another recession. I was just at an economic forum with world leaders. <coughs> they said, John, there's going to be another recession. I said, good. I'm not participating. Yes, yes. They said, what? I said, no, I'm making a positive confession that I'm not participating, but when the recession does come, I'll buy all of your houses. They said, what? I said, if we start thinking like we're going to come out on head, that we're going to come out on the top, we're not going to lose in this next season. Aren't you tired of losing? Everywhere you turn, the church losing ground, the culture losing ground. It's time for someone, somewhere to say, I am no longer a slave. I am a child of the living God. I don't have to live like I used to live. I don't have to live like they told me. I don't have to be like they are in the ghetto. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I've been bought by the blood. I don't have to have stinking thinking. I don't have to worry about, well, what am I going to do tomorrow? I'm tired of letting fear rule my life. Well, well, you know, if the doctor clears me, no, I'm going to live my day in victory and in righteousness and with integrity, with clean hands and a pure heart, 
and I'm going to say, Lord, I'm going to ascend your mountain. I'm going to go to the hill of the Lord. I'm going to climb that mountain with my hands wide open because I trust you, God. I trust the process and the journey that you have me through. And I know it can be hard, church. I know there can be hard and difficult seasons, but I tell you what's going to help you. Get real and get real really fast. Because if you can get real and come to the end of yourself and say, I, I can't do it by myself, you'll realize that your greatest weapon still lies within you. The hope of glory. He's the hope of glory. And he's changing everything. You're in a season of such transition. I tell you this, I'm prophesying over you. Some of you need to hear this word. Everything's about to change. I'm telling you, I'm speaking to some of your spirits right now. Everything's about to change. You are not going back to the way it was. Your business is about to change. You're about to see exploits in the supernatural realm. Your finances are about to change. Your position is about to change. You're about to come into such increase unlike you've ever seen. Pastor, this church is about to go through the greatest financial breakthrough it's ever seen in the next 36 months. The Lord says, get ready, get ready, get ready for the next 30 36 months, there is a transition upon you that you are going to dig, dig deep into the word and you're going to extract the truth. But the Lord says, I'm giving you the secret places, the secret places, the secret places, the ancient paths in scripture that is going to unleash the new Joshua's, the new Joseph's. There's a Joseph's portal opening up in this house. I'm telling you, you are not going to be the same. Because you can't afford to be the same. That's you this morning, you're here, this afternoon, you say, that's me. I, I've been operating in slave thinking. Stand to your feet right now. I want to pray for you. I'm not dismissing the service, so don't leave yet. Lift your hands in the glory realm. God, we're sorry that we limited you. That we didn't trust you that you could come through. That we weren't always sure. We weren't always confident. Father, this afternoon, give us the God confidence. Give us your confidence that you always come through. You're always around the corner. You're the 11th hour God and the deal always gets done. Father, we call forth the infusion of faith in this place. I declare that this church will be known as a church of faith. That these people will be known as a people of faith, supernatural faith. I cancel their stinking thinking. Place your hands on your head. Say, Lord, I repent for the stinking thinking that has kept me and my family in bondage and slavery. Today, I break the chains over me and my generations. I plead the blood of the Lamb. And the word of my testimony. So I overcome the works of the enemy. Father, today, renew my mind to be based in the word. That I would not sway, but I'd be grounded and rooted by your presence in your word. Father, today, I rededicate and consecrate my life to live in the fullness that you have in store for me. I come against the lies of the enemy that have told me I couldn't, I wouldn't, I shouldn't, and I say I shall, I will, and I must. Father, thank you right now. I'm asking for angels to be released right in this place. Touch your people now, Father. Send your wind of faith in this room. I tell you, my, I have a gift of faith, and this happens, but sometimes when I preach, my hands become on fire. I know there's supernatural faith in the room. There's faith in the room right now. And in my belly, it's like a basketball going up and down. It's waves of faith being released. There's waves of faith being released right now. Sir, there's waves of faith being released to you right now. In Jesus' name, take it. Father, 
You're not done here. You're not done here. Oh, namba sekini namba. Be seated just for a minute, just for a minute. Stay in the presence. Here's what I want to do. I want to receive a pure faith offering to the Lord. I want to receive a pure, I, I feel there's going to be a breaker's anointing in your finances. And I'm going to, I'm going to do a, a, a call in a moment, but I, I, a pure, this is a pure faith offering. This is not, you, you're going to give something so you're going to get something. This isn't, well, you know, a hundredfold, a thousandfold, although there's times for that. This is a pure faith offering. Just saying, God, I, I'm giving it out of a sacrificial attitude because it, you're, it's, it's yours. It's all yours. And when you come to this place where it's not about what you're going to get or not about a scripture that you're going to sow into, but it's simply faith. I have found in my life that one of the purest gifts that I ever can give in financial times is a pure gift of faith. And when you do this, it accelerates and it activates your finances in a dimension that you know not of. And all through my life, how I've come out of slave mentality in my finances is by sowing. If you need an offering envelope, the ushers are going to come right now and serve you. Checks are made payable to be a hero. You can give by credit card on your offering envelopes. Yes, we need the microphone, Pastor. Yeah, you know, John's not just saying that to stimulate you to bring money up. I, I felt the power of God flowing through my arms while he was praying that simple prayer. And I feel the presence of the Lord. I, I don't get anything from me telling you this. I'm just telling you this in the spirit realm that he's carrying a very important financial anointing. If you understood all the things that are happening in John's life, you'd even know even more. I mean, he has governmental authority right now at the very highest level the very highest level right now. And he is working tightly with the highest level people in government. And he's carrying something very important and something very powerful. And plus, here's the thing that I do also know about John is this, is that he's also operating the highest level in, of integrity. John and I are sister and brother, uh, not only because we have the same mother, Patricia King, but because we have the same ethics. Yeah. Okay, we are both highly sensitive to any corruption, any deceit, any manipulation or anything that happens in ministry. And we're basically pretty frustrated with what we see happening in other ministries. And so we are making sure that we are audited. Both of our ministries are independently audited every year. We are making sure that we're staying at the utmost clean, cleanness. We, we you know, anybody could come in and inspect both of our ministries right now. And we're so clean. It's, yeah. I, I love being this clean. It's so amazing. But there's power right now in the room. My arms right now are still, they're not only hot, but they're cold. Like there's healing and deliverance at the same time. So I just came up and basically emptied my purse on the stage. <laughs> I kept 20 bucks for myself so I could tip my driver <laughs> when I got home. Okay, so I invite you to sew. This is not hype or anything else, but there's a presence here right now for financial breakthrough. I know that from experience, and I'm feeling it energized. Right now I have energy flowing through my body. So you, just ask the Lord what you should sow because the realm is open right now for you to get a breakthrough. Thank you. Um, just ushers, don't receive the baskets, please. What I'm going to ask you to do, first of all, is there's some of you that your business needs a financial breakthrough. And the Lord just spoke to me. If you need a financial breakthrough in your business, I want you to come forward. I want you to put your seat on the altar. I want you to stand on this line. I'm going to lay hands on you. We're going to activate, and I'm going to break that slave mentality over your business. For the rest of you, when you give a faith offering, it's important you go before the Lord. And you're not giving it to me. You're not giving it to our ministry. It's, it's unto the Lord. So I want you to come to the altar and present it before the Lord. Not so nobody sees what you're giving. It's, it's not about that. It's not about what anybody else sees. It's about you and the Lord. And some of you are giving the most generous seed you've ever sown, and you're nervous. It's like, God, you gave me an amount, but I've never done this before. You Pray about it. There's no pressure. This isn't hype. It's not pressure. I want you to give a faith offering that you know is acceptable to the Lord. That, and it's each according to your faith. Let it be done. But when you're ready, I want you to come to the altar. I want you to present your gift. But if your business needs a financial breakthrough, I would say in the next seven days, like in the next seven days, if something doesn't change, you don't know what's going to happen, I want you to come to this left side. I'm going to lay hands on you. Come right over here. My hands are on fire. I'm telling you, there's an impartation for you. Hey, sanana na ramba. 
Hosana na ramba. Sika na 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 ramba se. Hosana ba se. Some of you even, I feel like for real estate, you're waiting like mortgage issues. There's some issues in your real estate. You need to sow right now. There's an activation in the spirit. Thank you, Lord. Father, right now in Jesus' name. I say faith. Faith release now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let it come right now. Faith in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Faith now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Receive the peace of the Lord. The Lord says, I'm giving you peace. 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 We break it off. We break off the lie. We break off the lie. You will. You will overcome. Faith now in Jesus' name. Take it. There it is. Jesus name. There it is. Hey, Shoko Namba. Jesus name. Osana na na namba. As freely as I receive, so freely I impart. Faith now in Jesus name. Father, right now I call forth a thousandfold increase. Father, I call forth a magnified offering seed. Father, I call forth a financial turnaround unlike she's ever seen before. Where she's been blessed, she's going to be extremely blessed. I call forth the Joseph's anointing. Now, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. Put your hand on your belly, my dear. The Lord says, I'm activating. I'm activating you. I'm activating you. In Jesus' name. Faith now, in Jesus' name. There it comes, there it comes. It's turnaround time. The Lord says, it's turnaround time. Get ready, get ready, get ready, because you are not going back. Faith now in Jesus' name. Faith now in Jesus' name. Fan the flame, fan the flame, fan the flame. Fan the flame. So the Lord says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Faith now in Jesus' name. Father, right now, as freely I receive, so freely I give. Faith now in Jesus' name. Turn it around. Turn it. Turn it around. Turn it around. Turn it around. The Lord says, you've been stabbed in the back, but the Lord says, today I'm taking the knives out of your back. I'm taking, I'm washing your back. You're not going to be betrayed anymore. No, no, no. That season's done. It's over. I call forth your victory. Your victory in Jesus' name. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, turn it around. Faith right now, in Jesus' name. Faith in Jesus' name. Oh, it's not over, it's not over, says the Lord. It's not over, it's not over, says the Lord. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, because you are coming into an increase right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Wow, there it is. Hey. Wow. New season, new season, new season, new season. Fresh anointing. Come and have your way. There it is. Jesus' name. Faith in Jesus' name. Faith now in Jesus' name. Faith now in Jesus' name. There it is. In Jesus' name. Faith. 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 It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Freely as I receive, so freely I give. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Faith now. New season, new season, new season. Let a double portion be yours. In Jesus' name. Faith now. Jesus. Receive it, receive it. In Jesus' name. Oh, 
No more lack. No more. I bind that spirit in Jesus' name. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. And I call forth the future. I call forth, the Bible says, the prophet woman, she smiles at her future. You're going to laugh at your future. It is bright. Smile at it. Smile at it. Jesus. There's a reason I'm praying for you twice. The Lord says, you need it. Now, in Jesus' name. Oh, na na ba se ke Oh, sa na na Eh, eh, ho! na ba se Have your way, have your way, have your way Have your way, ancient of days The Lord says, get ready For you are coming into great increase No more lies, no more believing the lie I cancel the lies <laughs> Now, in Jesus' name I open up your spirit to dream again. Oh, no more lies, no more lies. Future, future, future focused, future focused, future focused. Oh, na 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 say. Oh, come and fan the flame gun. Come and fan the flame gun. In Jesus' name. Oh, sa na 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 Lord says, no more shame. No more shame. For you are coming into a new season. You have been released from the past. So shine bright like a diamond. For you have a calling and a purpose and a destiny. No more shame. Lift your hands, my dear. The Lord says, today I'm breaking you free. I'm breaking you free, and it's your coming out party. You're coming out now before the whole body of Christ. For this is your season of acceleration. I call forth your spirit to be open to dreaming and soaring with God. I call forth the double portion. <laughs> In Jesus' name. Hey, shaka namba soko namba. Rese ke na na namba rosoko no na namba. Sheke na na namba soko no na namba. Hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. He's got you. He's got you. He's not giving up on you. Not when you've come this far. Don't you give up. Not when you've come this far. In Jesus' name. Faith. 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 Jesus name. Yeah, there it is. There it is. There it is. Ora ra ramba se ne 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 na namba. O sa na na namba. Hope again. In Jesus name. Yeah, there it is. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. Oh, oh, there it is. Wow. <laughs> In Jesus' name. Ora ra ramba se. Eke sa na 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 ba se ne he. Oh, oh, there it is. The Lord says, I'm moving you around. I'm moving you around. I'm moving you around because you're so flexible in this next season. Get flexible. Because the Lord says your prosperity is in your flexibility. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the future. We set our mind on things above. We cancel any negativity or depression now. Bind it. I get out in Jesus' name. Peace. Faith. In Jesus' name. Anointing him. A breaker's anointing. In Jesus' name. Hope again, sir. Hope again. Hope again. Faith. 
The Lord says, laugh at it. Laugh at it. You've got to laugh at it. You've got to laugh at it. Oh, it's been dark and it's been stormy, but you've got to laugh at it because you are coming out ahead. You are coming out ahead. So we say, ha, 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 ha. Father, right now, open up the wells of joy in Jesus' name. <laughs> Fire now in Jesus' name. Hope again. Hope again. Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for my brother. Father, I release the gift of faith, Father. It's really as I receive, so it's the way I give. For this next season and this next chapter, I call forth the financial portals of heaven to be open now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for the apostolic gift of finance to be upon him now. As I lay my hands on him, Father, I thank you that today he is receiving an upgrade in the spirit realm, which no man can put asunder. Today we declare him an apostle of faith. In Jesus' name. Father, right now. Father, right now. Wow. I give to you the Esther's anointing. That you will be used in many ways to save many people. That God's going to call you in an unlikely hour. Father, right now we release upon her that Esther's mantle. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Mm. The Lord says, the days have seemed long and the nights even longer. And this past season has been hard. But joy comes in the morning. For it's about to break open, says the Lord. It's about to break open. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. I say spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. <laughs> Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Freely I receive, so freely I give. Hallelujah. More, Lord. More. More, Lord. Ho, Shah. The Lord says, get ready. Get ready to be raised up in this hour. Get ready. Get ready. For even the Lord says, you've seen people have disqualified you. They told you you couldn't and you wouldn't. But the Lord says, you shall. You shall and you will. So receive the victor spirit now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Mm. For the Lord says, even now in this season, I've raised you up like a Joseph in the land. Even now, it feels like you've been through the seasons of Joseph. And if you reflect on the story, even now, says the Lord, there is a new dimension about to open up to you, and that is the dimension of rulership. For the Lord says, get ready for the mantle. The mantle's about to fall. The mantle's about to fall. This house will be known as a house of faith. This house will be known as a house of faith. Many faith ministries will come through here. And the Lord says, do not refuse them at your door. Do not refuse them at your door. For this door will be open and the Spirit will come rushing in. For the Lord says, in this season, many, many businesses will be launched. And this house will produce millionaires of the kingdom. Father, we mix our faith together now. Father, we ask for that breaker's anointing. In Jesus' name, release it now. Thank you, Jesus. Give us kale of the blessing to you. That you'll be known as the kale of the land.
you shall be known as a fruitful man. A fruitful man. Do not believe the lies of the enemy, but you shall be known as a fruitful man. Catch it. Oh, na 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 ba Oh, ra ra ramba. Ke sa na 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 ramba se. Oh, sa na ba se. Oh, ko ra ramba. Ke sa na na ramba. For the Lord says, get ready, get ready, get ready, for the portals are opening up all around you. Get ready to hear my voice in a very clear way. For even now, says the Lord, I've heard your prayers, I've heard your petitions, I've seen your tears before me, and you've come before the altar time and time again. But the Lord says, you've only wanted my presence, you've only wanted the power, but now today, today, receive a double portion. But the Lord says, you have not been put to shame, you have not been not trusted, but you have been trusted in the kingdom. And today, he says, well, done good and faithful servant well done well done well done we rebuke the lies we rebuke the shame we rebuke the enemy that he tried to steal your thoughts we say get your hands off his mind for today the lord says see you've been seated in heavenly places and so we release your mind from captivity now in jesus name Oh, na na ramba se, o kosa na nambare. It's not over, says the Lord. It's not over. You still need to be activated. You still need, there's more needed of you in this hour than ever before. You cannot shrink back. You cannot sit in the back. The Lord says you're being pulled to the front because in this season, the Lord hath need of you in the kingdom. Now more than ever before, he hath need of you. And these are going to be the greatest years of your life. For the Lord says, get ready, get ready, get ready for a double portion of a father's blessing to be upon your life. In Jesus' name. Kora ramba seke ne na namba. My friend, oh ra 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 ramba se, kosa na 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 namba se, kosa na 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 namba. The Lord says, in this hour, get ready to be used as a master strategist in the kingdom. And as you are listening, be open to the others' feedback for there's wise counsel in many. But the Lord says, even in this season, as you gather the voices, different voices that come together, you will find the answer amongst you all. For you are to be a, a leader. I feel like a spearheading leader for economics in this city. And I feel there's even a release of a governmental anointing on your life. That this is your season to dream bigger. This is your season to go after things that you never thought possible. For the Lord says, the favor of the Lord is on you. And when there is favor, it's the season to act. And the doors and the portals of favor are open to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to bless you. Father, they're faithful workers. Pour out your power on them. The Lord says you're looking for the real thing. You've been looking for the real thing. You've been looking. Is this the real meal deal? Is this the truth? Is this really what this is about? And the Lord says, open your eyes, son. Look around you. Open your eyes and look around you, for there isn't anything more real. For even in this season, I'm bringing you more into the supernatural. You're going to go deeper and deeper into the supernatural. You're going to go deeper and deeper. You're going to see healing, signs and wonders through your own hands by the power of Jesus manifested through you. And the Lord says, stay focused. Don't be distracted. For many distractions will try to take away your call. But listen to my voice. In Jesus' name. I've had a word for you all night. For the Lord says you are not disqualified. And you are precious in his kingdom. And the Lord says... You are a princess in the house. To continue to keep your head up, not down, for your past does not 
discriminate against your future for you are called and chosen for a time and your voice is going to set people free for you know you're called. Many are called, few are chosen, but the Lord says, I chose you, I've called you. You know, you know, you know, you know. The Lord says, you've been hearing the call in the middle of the night. You've been getting dreams in the middle of the night. The Lord says, I'm calling you deeper and deeper and deeper and you cannot keep running from the call for it's in the call that there is the future. And the Lord says, stay focused on the word. Be memorized by the word. Be, just be taken by the word. For you're going to go deeper and deeper than you've been before. And the Lord says, finances will never be an issue in your life if you put your trust in me. If you seek first the kingdom, then all these other things will be added unto you. There are many, many major decisions in the coming three years. And the Lord says, take heed. Take heed to the counsel around you. For these next three years will dictate your future. In Jesus' name. Last call. Thank you, Lord. Father, right now, in Jesus' name. The Lord says, you have a future. You have a future. He's not done with you. You're not disqualified. And now we activate this next season of your life that you're going to be stronger than ever before. Your health is going to be better than ever before. We come against the lies of the enemy. We say, no, those are lies. We know the truth by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. We overcome the works of the enemy. We declare that now in Jesus' name. It's funny how when you do last call, how many more come up. I'm going to pray for you all, but just be do that, I'm going to dismiss the service. I'll, I'll come back and pray for you. What I'm going to do, I just felt the Lord said, many of you need, I've done a whole um, 15 hours of breaking slave mentality, the course, of, it just part of what I taught today. If you buy the Soul Detox, the $99 set, there's only 20 sets, I'm going to give you the free online access to the breaking slave mentality course as well. Just want to sow that into you. So please go back to the table. They'll get your information, your mailing address. God bless you. I'm ministering tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning on Breakers Anointing. I'm going to be imparting that as well tonight, Katie Souza. God bless you. We'll see you tonight. Thank you, Lord.